Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Teela's Quest, an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, produced by Filmation Studios. Teela's Quest, by far one of the most memorable, nay best episodes of the entire series. Quite possibly the best episode of the entire series. Episode 6 for those keeping count. Before we get into this commentary, I'll best mention that as this was one of the earliest episodes produced, it was actually featured alongside both Diamond Ray of Disappearance and Colossal Awakes in the director video special The Greatest Adventures of All, which was also shown as a premiere at the Man's Chinese Theatre in Los Angeles two days before the series debuted on the 26th of September 1983 in the United States. The premiere had people dressed up as He-Man, Skeletor, Teela, Evil Lynn, even Orko, though that costume, as you can imagine, was slightly terrifying. So yeah, this episode has always been one of my absolute favourites, mainly due to the heavy character writing by the great Paul Dini. Dini was a huge fan of Marvel Comics, and so he was unable to write simple action-adventure stories. He had to delve deep into character relationships, much like Stan Lee did back in the 60s and 70s with many of the classic superheroes. Queen Marlena, Prince Adam, Man-at-Arms, and of course, Teela and the Sorceress have their respective character relationships explored in varying detail throughout this episode, all with great success. Thinking about it, King Randor is the only missing member of the royal family in this episode, but Paul Dini would perfectly explore King Randor's relationship with his son Prince Adam in the episode Prince Adam No More, another character-heavy script. But for now, this is Teela's quest. So yeah, the episode starts off with this pretty intense flashback. Marlena Glenn, who obviously goes on to become Queen Marlena, refers to this ship as the Earth Probe Valiant. But when this story is revisited in the season 2 classic The Rainbow Warrior, penned by Bob Ford, the name of the ship is changed to the more attractive sounding Rainbow Explorer. It is interesting when you think about it, the flashback showcases a pivotal moment in the history of the planet Eternia, an astronaut from Earth crash lands on the planet later marries the king, and more importantly, gives birth to the twins of power, He-Man and She-Ra. Although, right now, we're really only aware of He-Man, right? There's just something so incredibly beautiful, natural even, with regards to this scene between Prince Adam and Queen Marlena, which I have to talk over, unfortunately, as this is an episode commentary, after all. The scene is written and acted that it genuinely feels like a mother and son sharing a moment of deep reflection. Aside from both Linda Gary and John Owen doing an incredible job with their respective roles, the music for the scene by Shooky Levy perfectly complements what is written. And speaking of Linda Gary, I have to give a huge shout out to her. I mean, in this episode she voices Queen Marlena, Teela and the Sorceress, and ensures that all three characters sound unique and have their own literal voice. What's amazing about the first seven or so minutes of this episode is that we simply witness life in the Royal Palace. No villains of the week, no invading forces, no destructive artifact. This episode is driven by characters and it's beautiful. I love this, Linda Gary, who mere moments ago was playing the reflective, softly spoken Queen Marlena, is now playing Teela and she has a much sharper delivery, a stronger voice. I just love the way she exclaims, and where were you this afternoon? So we go from one character relationship, that of mother and son, to the relationship between Prince Adam and Teela. And Teela is all kinds of ready to kick Prince Adam's ass, as usual. As a kid, I always wanted Teela to put the memory projector on Prince Adam, and we would see him in action as He-Man, leading to utter confusion on the part of Teela. Sadly, we simply see him fishing with Cringer, or maybe he was out saving the day as He-Man, and this is some sort of... Jedi mind trick? Hmm. See you on the drilling field. Before I forget, I'll just quickly talk about the previous flashback to Queen Marlena's time as an Earth astronaut. Thankfully, Paul Dini didn't refer to or mention in this script the original series Bible concept by Michael Halperin, which saw Marlena Glenn be one of four Earth pilots that crash landed on Eternia. By now, you should all know the story, but for those that don't, on the ship, the other three Earthlings were to be Evelyn Powers. Biff Beastman and Dr. T. E. Scope. Those three Earthlings would wind up in the vicinity of Snake Mountain and end up in the servitude of Skeletor, transformed. Evelyn Powers becoming Evil Lynn, Biff Beastman becoming Beast Man, and Dr. T. E. Scope becoming Triclops. One could argue that even though we don't see them in the flashback, 
that they are present. Filmation could have easily gone back to this scene in a later episode and have the other three working feverishly at the back of the ship, repairing damage caused by the asteroid storm. Thankfully, as this plot point is never addressed in the series, for the record and for peace of mind, let's just state that they are not on the ship, okay? And now we get another character relationship explored, the often explosive one between Man-at-Arms and Orko. This is actually a quintessential scene between the pair. The scene is also laced with some wonderful underlying humour that isn't obvious at first. When Man-at-Arms remarks that Orko's last surprise for the royal family nearly burned down the castle, it's a great line as it conjures some rather hilarious images in our minds. Much like Diamond Ray of Disappearance, Orko is illustrated and animated rather uniquely from shot to shot as the artist's and animators attempted to get a hold of the character. I love the music box somehow inexplicably playing music, making it seem that all is right with the world and that Orko did no wrong, only for the gag to finally pay off with an off-screen explosion and Man at Arms actually breaking the fourth wall, something that Filmation would really only ever do during the moral segment of each episode. Lou Scheimer as Orko, easily his best voice role in the series. Even though it was processed, he still had to deliver the timing of each and every line as well as certain emotions depending on the content of the script. And so, at this point in the episode, barely five minutes in, we've had Prince Adam and Queen Marlena's relationship covered, Prince Adam and Teela's relationship covered, Man at Arms and Orko's relationship covered, and now we're about to see a truly beautiful scene between Teela and her adopted father Man at Arms. Both the dialogue in this scene and the pitch-perfect acting by Linda Gary and Alan Oppenheimer truly elevate this beyond a simple Saturday morning cartoon. This is such a touching scene with Teela wanting to find out more about her real father, a man at arms sworn to secrecy, only telling Teela that her father was one of the greatest men he ever knew. He gave his life in battle so that Eternians could live in peace. Without showing a flashback, the dialogue and acting paint an incredible picture of Eternia's past and the true heroism of Teela's real father. And scenes like this, when we don't need quick edits or lots of animation, Filmation's stock system keeps the characters firmly on screen and we can't look away as the direction and dialogue captures our collective attention. Again, Paul Dini truly works his magic as he has Teela attempting to drive the conversation into learning of the identity of her parents, with Man Arms trying to find the right words to put his daughter's mind at ease. The little flashbacks of Teela's life are lovely. Orko's line asking Teela if Cringer used her shield as a water dish again in response to seeing her sad once more conjures up such interesting visuals, albeit amusing ones on this occasion. We can only imagine how furious Teela was upon discovering Cringer drinking water out of her shield. It's actually one of my favourite Orko lines in the series because Orko asks the question so innocently and it's a testament to Paul Dini that he can have a comical piece of dialogue followed by this somewhat serious exchange between Teela and Orko, proving to every other writer on the series that you can write Orko as a serious character when needs be. Here we see Orko suddenly fear for Teela, showing that he cares, whereas other writers may have had him cheerlead Teela into a dangerous mission. Again, Lou Scheimer delivering Orko's dialogue with great weight to it. And it's not throwaway dialogue, Orko cares for his friend and does not want to see her hurt in the slightest. The image of Prince Adam and Cringer fixing the sky sled was oddly a heavily used image in the promotion of season one of He-Man. It appeared on everything from posters to jigsaws. Someone somewhere obviously thought that it was a rather fascinating image. You'll notice in one shot here that Orko does not have ears. Oddly, numerous storyboard artists would illustrate the little trollin without any ears. Poor Orko. I'll break away from this episode just for the moment as the next few scenes are pretty straightforward and I'll talk about the whole sorceress Teela mother daughter connection. Don't worry we will return to the episode. So prior to the Filmation cartoon there was no sorceress. There was the goddess who pretty much had the same role as the sorceress. However in order to explain why the goddess and Teela were pretty much the same action figure DC came up with the idea that Teela was a clone of the sorceress in one of the best mini comics of the series The Tale of Teela. It explained that Skeletor created a clone of the goddess. His plan was to raise the infant clone and eventually marry her, combining their powers to conquer the universe. It's a rather ambitious plan, Skeletor. Well, rather than go down that route, at some point, only in the production of the cartoon series, possibly during the actual writing of the series Bible by Michael Halperin, the decision was made to have the sorceress be Teela's mother. 
Whilst I do love the original DC Comics canon, the Filmation version is a lot easier to warm to. The story of a unique mother-daughter relationship works throughout the series and kind of makes Teela an incredibly strong character for it. Of course it helps that this episode is one of the finest written episodes of the series, but going back to what I just said, for those of you that think I'm just a fan of the Filmation cartoon, you're so wrong. I love what DC Comics did before the cartoon, especially those seven mini comics they produced, those are simply amazing. In the original script, shortly after Merman has demanded his revenge, Skeletor uses his Havoc staff to transport the Ocean Warlord from Snake Mountain to the Crystal Sea, but we don't get to see that here. So here we are in the Crystal Sea, one of Eternia's most underused locations. It's described in the script to look a lot less inviting, the waters were going to be black, the rock structures grey, it was supposed to be hideous, whereas here, in my opinion, it looks rather pleasant, if not a little on the chilly side. Actually, before I forget, in one of the earliest drafts of the script, the Shadow Beasts were known as Shadow Apes. Speaking of Shadow Beasts, they are so badass in their original appearance, they remain fairly menacing in their sporadic appearances in the series, but in this environment they just seem more unwelcoming. Unwelcoming, strange word to use. This scene also showcases just how tough a character Teela is. She is not the damsel in distress, and this is something I should stress about Teela throughout the series. She is never the damsel in distress. Granted, she ends up in some odd situations and needs rescuing, as do other characters, but she is never helpless and will always do her best to help herself. And when all seems lost, Teela still has a trick or two up her sleeve or within her tunic. And we see here the two best surefire ways to defeat a shadow beast. You either use bright light or you just kick them up the bum. And there's a fantastic cut here from Teela declaring that she's getting back to business, to He-Man and Battle Cat racing to aid Teela in her quest. I always love that looping sequence of He-Man and Battle Cat racing along, it's a striking piece of animation. Again we see some truly creative backgrounds on the part of the Filmation background artists. Here the Oracle's cave is an almost precarious structure, but it looks glorious. And Teela continues to make her way to the Oracle of the Crystal Sea. The Oracle of the Crystal Sea is such a fantastic plot device and character. It's such a shame they never brought him back during the series. Also check out the detailing on the character's face. Many years ago I was watching this episode and it kind of dawned on me. The design is clearly supposed to be Vincent Price. Look at the face, the gaunt features, the facial hair and the eyes, especially the eyes. It is utterly Vincent Price. So now we get to see the adventures of a young man at arms, kind of like a young Indy Jones. Sadly we don't get to see a young version of Merman, that would have been a pretty interesting visual. But we do get to see the Fishmen in their first and only appearance in the series, unless you count the one Fishman that shows up in the episode The Heart of a Giant, episode 65, but we won't count that. This is such a great flashback as well, everything about the structure of it is perfect. And the direction, the camera tilts, the pans from the top of the mountain to the bottom, it just creates such a wonderful sense of height. Man Arms is clearly an accomplished mountain climber or mountaineer. It's also fantastic to see one of the evil warriors play such an incredibly important role in the history of Eternia. I mean, given how Merman and most of the evil warriors would end up in the series as bumbling oafs, Merman is anything but bumbling in this story. He's pretty terrifying when you think about it. The Ocean Warlord is strengthened by the deep intonations of Alan Oppenheimer's voice and the wicked facial expressions given to him by the animators throughout this particular episode. Merman's passion for this mission and his drive, as seen here in the flashback, is unrivaled. He is driven to kidnap Teela in the present day in order to seek vengeance on Man at Arms for an incident that occurred 20 years ago. This is not the Merman we come to know in the series, and it's a shame. I've always loved the moment in which the flashback comes to a grinding halt and the fish man attacks Teela. The way in which the camera moves to create a sense of both urgency and drama is perfect and once again shows what you can achieve with a limited budget and perfectly timed animation. Actually in the script the moment was less startling and more action based. Teela fights the fish man only to be overpowered with Merman entering the Oracle's cave shortly after. The changes made here, presumably during the storyboard process, were, I think you'll agree, infinitely better. And as I said earlier, Teela is no damsel in distress. Yes, she's been captured, but she's ready to take on Merman and the Fishmen without any hesitation. Again, Merman is given a great backstory with him referring to Man at Arms as his old enemy. It's hard to imagine anything close to this kind of dialogue coming out of his mouth in the latter half of the second season of the show. 
Whenever Merman refers to Man at Arms, it's always with an angry disgust. There seems to be a historic rivalry between the two men at work here that goes beyond just the flashback we see. Ah, what could have been with the series had it stayed the course. Don't get me wrong, I love this cartoon and it is perfect in so many ways. But when you look at these early episodes, it's obvious just how focused on creating a vast mythos the writers were. And here we get a brief moment at Castle Grayskull. I understand why this scene is here, although I think it's kind of unnecessary. If the sorceress had showed up later in the episode, we'd all be perfectly accepting of that fact. The shot of the sorceress transforming into Zora and flying directly over Orko's head, prompting him to disappear, would later be reused in the time corridor. I, I say later, that's two episodes from this one. In this scene between He-Man and the Oracle, we get to hear John Irwin's range as he speaks in the heroic, powerful tones as He-Man, as well as the softly spoken tones of the Oracle. Yeah, based on this scene alone, I'd love to have seen the Oracle return. Just have a one-on-one -on -one with He-Man. And once again, the filmation background artists deliver the goods. The Crystal Sea looks magnificent in these shots. That said, I still don't feel a sense of dread from these backgrounds as I'm supposed to. It actually makes me want to visit. Maybe there's like a brochure or something. Come visit the Crystal Sea. Come and see the sights. Come see where Teela was nearly sacrificed to an evil sea demon. Or maybe not. In a really nice piece of writing, Merman begins to tell Teela that he had once selected a victim. Although he never mentions Zor the Falcon by name, it is strongly implied that he knew the Great Bird was rather important. Which is odd given that every other appearance Zor makes in the series, the villains have no idea as to the identity of the Falcon. And I don't mean the identity, the secret identity of the Sorceress, they just don't seem to acknowledge Zor as a character. Again, the earlier scripts of the series had a far stronger mythology and I believe that that was somewhat missed by the time Season 2 rolled around. Yes, we had some amazing episodes in Season 2, don't get me wrong. Some of the best of the series, in fact. But the vibe in some of these early episodes evokes that feel of the DC mini-comics that I previously mentioned. It's great seeing Merman, the ocean warlord, in such a commanding role here, high atop the Crystal Sea with his staff in hand. We get the sense, even if it's for a brief moment or two, that Merman is unstoppable. He is out of the reach of He-Man and Battle Cat and shouts to the heavens using the Crimson Pearl to raise the sea demon Bakul. Not for one second do we really think that He-Man and Battle Cat are going to be stopped by a door here. Actually, speaking of the most powerful man in the universe, what is truly wonderful about this episode is that he is a guest star in his own show. He has so few lines of dialogue. The reason I say that it is wonderful is because it shows just how deep, even at this early stage, the scripts could go by exploring other key characters in the series. The script details Bakul as resembling a creature inspired by the works of 20th century master of weird fiction H.P. Lovecraft, but as you can see, Filmation opted for the simpler muscle-bound humanoid beast. They would revisit the Lovecraftian design with The Sleeping Beast, a creature that appears in the season 1 episode House of Shikoti Part 2. In the script, when He-Man confronts Bakul, the script originally had them battle underwater, with He-Man knocking Bakul from the murky waters and onto the shore again. And as the He-Man theme song kicks in, the sorceress, Zor, takes the Crimson Pearl away from Merman and you'll know what happens next. Actually, one could see this as the sorceress getting a little bit of revenge against Merman as it was his actions originally that prompted her to give Teela to Man at Arms. The sorceress striking out at Merman, destroying his staff and his dreams of conquering Eternia demonstrates the first rule of parenting, to love and protect your child. Merman messed with the wrong family, simple as that. And here comes He-Man to save Merman, one of the earliest instances in the series of He-Man saving the life of his foe. Although watch as Merman takes a rather nasty tumble, I'm actually surprised he survives that fall. And then, of course, Merman, being the bad guy after all, just runs away. To be honest, we wouldn't have it any other way with the Ocean Warlord. He was always a bit of a coward. Actually, going briefly back to House of Shikoti Part 2, here we see He-Man using his leg muscles to push this large piece of crystal over in order to defeat Bakul. In House of Shikoti Part 2, as He-Man attempts to bury the sleeping beast, this piece of animation is used once again. However, on that occasion, he's pushing over a giant statue of Shikoti, a very cool visual. And with that, Bakul is defeated, hooray! Actually, this reminds me, I've never been one for fan fiction, but in the late 90s, I had the idea for a script called The Return of Bakul. The opening would show shots of the Crystal Sea, and then we see a large pile of rocks under which Bakul had been buried. 
we then see a hand emerge and I've no idea what happens next that's as far as I got the idea of Bakul emerging from his burial at the start of an episode was good enough for me that was it that was the episode now Teela stands before the Oracle once again and begins to learn of a rather incredible origin. No character in the series has a more touching or emotionally charged backstory. The music, the voice acting, it's all so perfect. The Sorceress is such a beautifully tragic character. Her dialogue is laced with both strength and sadness, which is an incredibly tough ask for any voice actor or actress. But the late great Linda Gary delivered so much more. Also, credit has to go to Marsh Lamore, who directed the scene in a rather straightforward manner, wonderfully letting the dialogue dominate the scene with a few close-ups utilised perfectly. Paul Dini sadly may have long since denounced his work on this series, but Teela's Quest is an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe that is so much more. This story is one episode of the series that everyone seems to remember. This scene, this entire episode, above all others, has such a special place in the hearts of the fans, and rightfully so. You must forget what you have learned today. She will only remember that her mother was a woman who loved her very much. Teela finally comes face to face with her mother and the end result is an incredibly heartbreaking story of love and sacrifice. Remember everyone, this cartoon was simply about advertising toys, right? Yeah, right. This tragic, heart-tugging myth is the one He-Man episode we all remember. You cannot be a fan without having seen it. There's something about this story that resonates within all of us. Perhaps it's the search for one's parents or the love that connects parent and child. Whatever the unifying thread, this story is absolutely unforgettable. Here is the episode that is the crown jewel of the entire He-Man and She-Ra mythology. Produced as the sixth episode of the series, Teela's Quest is the first story to establish He-Man and the Masters of the Universe as a different kind of action-adventure series. This episode, Teela's Quest, will live on even when the rest of the series has faded from our memory because Teela's Quest lives in our hearts. Thankfully, other writers would use this classic episode as a guide when penning ideas of their own. Writers such as Larry DeTilio, Bob Forward, Robert Lamb, J. Michael Straczynski, they all explored the character of Teela and her relationship with those around her, leading to many other wonderful episodes of both character and world building. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I shall catch you on the next one.